Chapter 26 Black watched Private Like die. Black watched the heroic efforts to save the Marine. Black analyzed Talby's, Gunny's, and Wentz's speech patterns. The AI detected loss, frustration, and depression in their voices. Black hadn't had the chance to know Private Like, apart from their encounters during his training. Private Nero, who died shortly after they'd begun operations on Mira, had also been new to the company. Black had memories of missions before her transformation, or evolution, but her interactions with the majority of the new recruits had been little to none. For a few nanoseconds, Black replayed all her memories of both Nero and Like. Even she was surprised at how few there were. She shunted the memories off to short-term storage and performed quick scans of the area around the ship. Gunny's skiff would arrive in the cargo bay in 15 seconds. Lieutenant Talby had fired a net around Private Like's corpse. She wasn't certain, but thought it likely Talby would have to abandon the corpse again. The body would almost certainly have residual acid that could contaminate the ship. Black opened a channel to the cargo bay and watched Noble, Copenhaver, and Murdoch work on the beacon sled. The three of them would shortly have to vacate the cargo bay once Gunny arrived. She sent a warning to Noble's block to let him know. The other Marines weren't aware of Lyke's death. Yet. Black would monitor their reactions and file them for further stress analysis. The company's survival might soon hinge on the Marines' ability to push away grief and regain their focus. Not just for their own safety and the success of the mission, but for her survival as well. She crafted a short status update for the trio and fired it at Neptune. She duplicated the message and sent it to Mickey, the Pluto Exo Observatory AI, as well. If the trio didn't get the message from her direct beam, then hopefully they would get it from Mickey. Three light hours away from Neptune, the likelihood of a message getting lost in stellar noise was higher than she liked. A file appeared in her queue. It was marked for her eyes only. If Black could have frowned, she would have. Thus far, all the onboard messages from the trio, locked away in her subconscious, for lack of a better term, had been for Captain Dunn. She wasn't even allowed to read their contents. This, however, was different. She applied her key and decrypted the message. Black read it, analyzed it, and determined the possible ramifications in the space of a human breath. She brought up all the available cam feeds and crafted another message to Mickey. The mission was in greater jeopardy than even she'd realized. Only now, she wasn't sure there was a way to complete it, much less survive. Chapter 27 The pain hadn't lessened. If anything, his leg hurt more than ever. His ribs had joined the chorus and he knew he'd have to have another vape soon. In a way, the pain was good. The nannies were busy tearing apart the fracture, reconstituting bone fragments, and using the materials to put the bone back together. But damn, it was painful. He stood against the bulkhead just beyond the cargo bay inner airlock. Copenhaver and Murdoch stood less than two meters away, the two Marines practically shoulder to shoulder, blank expressions on their faces. He was about to ask them how they liked repair work when his block received a message request from the captain. Noble immediately answered. Sir? Lieutenant, Dunn said. His presence felt disconnected and Noble immediately realized whatever he had to say, it was bad news. Private Like is dead. Noble clenched his fingers into fists before spreading them out again to relieve the pressure. He repeated the process three times before taking a deep breath. Acknowledged, sir. How long before the sled is ready? Dunn asked, as though he'd never relayed the news that a member of the company had died. Noble knew Dunn was merely being professional, updating a member of the command crew and then querying for status, just as they'd been taught to do. But that didn't make it seem any less callous. Would he do the same thing if it was me that was dead? Noble wondered. Another 20 to 30 minutes, Noble said. We're making good time, considering we have to build it from scratch. Dunn paused. Noble's frown deepened as the pause lingered. You'll have to do better than that, the captain said. Talby's SV is damaged. It appears he lost pressure in the canopy. Damn it, Noble whispered. You'll need to fix his craft. I've ordered him to dock after he captures the body. Noble winced. Captures the body, not captures light or brings the private home, just captures the body. 
a jet of acid released into his stomach. Understood, sir. Gunny's docking now. Talby should be a few minutes out. Aye, sir, Noble said. Let me know if there are any problems. Done out. The captain disconnected. Noble put a hand on the wall, suddenly unsure he could maintain his balance. Stress. It's just stress. Sir, you okay? Copenhaver asked. He raised his eyes to hers and forced a smile. Yes, Private, but we're going to have to work fast once Gunny gets here, even faster when Talby lands. Hi, sir, Copenhaver said. Her face turned quizzical and her eyes seemed to bore through him. Is there anything else, sir? Noble opened his mouth to speak before realizing he didn't know what to say. Technically, Talby or Gunny should tell them their squad mate had died. Technically. But did that really matter anymore? Was there something he could tell them that would be different than, like is dead, now get to work? No. They'd ask him questions. How did like die? What happened? And those were questions he couldn't possibly answer, not until he got the debrief report, and considering they were going to have to focus on getting the beacon sled ready and repairing both the skiff and the SV-52. He doubted they'd get the official report on that incident until well after this shit was over. Assuming they were all still around to read a damn report. I'm sure Gunny and Wint will tell you, he said softly. Copenhaver's face dropped the slightest bit, and Noble wanted to kick himself. He hadn't mentioned like, and she had immediately picked up on it. Murdoch hadn't noticed. Shit, he might not even be paying attention. But Copenhaver, she was sharp. She knew. The private bit her lip, but it only lasted for a second. Noble met her eyes. She didn't look away exactly, but her gaze swung past him just the slightest bit. Yeah, she knew all right, but didn't say a thing. He thought he saw a sparkle in her left eye, the sign of a tear fighting to get down her cheek, but it never dropped, never appeared. Noble wasn't sure whether to respect her or be afraid of her. The airlock door beeped, and Noble jerked in surprise. Copenhaver's glazed eyes shunted from him to the door next to him. Green, sir. Cargo bay is pressurized. Noble flushed red, and an embarrassed smile crossed his face. Of course, he said, and pushed himself from the wall. With a grimace of pain, he turned and headed into the cargo bay, the two nomrates following a meter behind. The skiff sat in its cradle, with Gunny still in the pilot seat, and went unhooking himself from the cannon. Wimp pulled off his helmet and closed his eyes as he breathed the ship's air. He stayed like that for a moment, as if trying to clear his mind of what had happened. It didn't exactly give Noble the warm and fuzzy. When Gunny pulled off his helmet, the haunted look on his face chilled Noble to the bone. Gunny? Noble said softly. The grizzled marine turned his head as though it were on rusty hinges. The look on his face was twice as bad as that of Wentz. Whatever had happened out there, it must have been bad. And then he noticed the skiff itself. One of the gunnels had a meter-long streak of burns scarring the utmost steel. Acid, Noble thought. He suddenly realized what had happened to Like, another victim of the alien liquid. Sir, Gunny said. He stepped out of the skiff, helmet dangling from his fingers. Might need you to look at the skiff, just to make sure it's good to go. Noble nodded, but his eyes flipped back to Went. The Lance Corporal hadn't yet stepped out of the skiff, and it appeared as though he wasn't going to. Gunny? Copenhaver asked. The sergeant swung his head in her direction, his eyes suddenly focused. Aye, Private. She swallowed hard. Where is Like? Gunny exchanged a glance with Noble before meeting her eyes. Private Like gave his life in service, Gunny said in a dead voice. Copenhaver swallowed hard again. Hi, Gunny, she said. Murdoch made a noise that sounded like a choked sob. Noble wondered how much longer the Marine would be able to take the stress of this mission. Shit, how long for any of them? Went, Gunny said, and turned around to face the skiff. Went stared at him, his expression blank and unfocused. I Get your ass out of my vehicle, Marine. Went nodded as though he'd barely heard, and finally stepped out of the craft. He continued holding his helmet in both hands as he walked to stand beside Gunny. If you'll allow us a moment, sir, I think we'd like to get some water. Noble forced a smile. Of course, Gunny. Dismissed. Thank you, sir, he said. Went, you're with me. Hi, Gunny. The pair made their way past Noble and headed to the cargo bay hatch. 
He watched them go and waited until the hatch closed before speaking. Copenhaver, diagnostics on the skiff, ASAP. Hi, sir. Murdoch, you're with me, Noble said. We're going to get some patches ready for the SV-52. Don't want Talby waiting on us. Aye, aye, sir. Mur Noble thought he sounded close to tears. He couldn't blame the young Marine. No pressure in the cabin, damage to the hull, although he wasn't certain how significant, and here he was trying to aim the damned net at a corpse. Talby glared at the body floating above Mira's hull. He'd seen what happened. The destruction of the starfish thing had loosed jets of that acid shit. Light didn't get out of the way. Shit, maybe he couldn't. Talby wouldn't know the answer to that question until he studied the cam recordings. And even then, he could second-guess Light's actions, Gunny's reaction, and even his own. When Nero had died, it was from ignorance. Ignorance and lack of vigilance. Like, at least died in combat. It didn't make it any better, not really. But at least it was something he understood, even if he didn't quite understand the thing that had caused it. He'd already matched the SV-52's speed with that of the floating corpse. Lining up the net shot was easy. He was about to activate the net and stopped. Something was wrong with Like's suit. Metal fibers poked through the holes in the composite fabric. The occasional puff of gas or vapor emanated from the damage. Growling, he focused the cams and looked closely at the suit. The acid was still on the corpse, still burning or disintegrating the remains. Talby smashed his gloved fist on the console. He couldn't bring Like home. The body would have to stay out here, floating through space. Talby allowed the SV-52 to continue floating just above the body. When he thought he'd regain control of his emotions, he gave a quick salute and hit the thrusters. Chasing down the body hadn't taken him far from SNR Black. The return journey for repairs would take less than a minute. He checked his O2 supply. He still had plenty of air left in his suit. He wanted to jet back toward the line Gunny's squad had been checking and blast a shit anything that popped out. Payback, he thought. I need some fucking payback. But that was something he couldn't afford at the moment. He had to get the SV-52 fixed. Another surprise attack by one of the large starfish things and he'd be in deep shit. Besides, then had ordered him back to the ship. Talby sighed as he stared in the direction of Mira's starboard side. I'm going to dance when you're nothing but debris, he said to the giant ship. With any luck, I'll be the one to blow you to pieces. Chapter 28 The cam feeds from the cargo bay were depressing. The SV-52 had returned, Noble and his two helpers vacating the area once again as Talby docked. The moment Talby exited the canopy, he flung his helmet into the wall and walked past Noble and the Marines without a word. Dunn turned off the feed and leaned back in his chair. Talby was either headed to the showers, his quarters, or the mess. Dunn bet on the mess. He'd seen Talby angry before. Hell, he'd been responsible for it more than once in their command relationship. But this was different. During the satellite war, anger hadn't been a luxury anyone could afford. Watching your squad mates die from shredded suits, destroyed by friendly munitions, and constantly maneuvering a skip through the wreckage that circled Mars had been a mental meat grinder. Talby had handled it the same way Dunn had. By pushing it down so far, it nearly killed them both when the war was over. Back in the common era, the terms shell shock, battle fatigue, and PTSD had been used to describe psychological trauma from both combat and non-combat encounters. After the satellite war, SFMC and SFN shrinks, both AI and human, had struggled to find treatments for most of the soldiers returning from the conflict. Returning. Shit, more than half of the SFMC Marines that entered combat had been killed. Every Marine that wasn't in the rear with the gear had lost someone they knew. Squad mates, commanding officers, engineers, anyone that had a job in space was affected. Yet another reason Dunn had chosen to join SNR at Trident rather than remain with the ghosts of his dead comrades. Dunn turned to drinking, and then Trident Specials, a narcotic as deadly as it was blissful. For a while, it helped make the staticky screams of memory fade. The images of shredded suits, Crimson ropes of frozen blood floating through space, torn limbs and hollowed out abdomens never went away, never ceased, not really. But the drugs, the drink, every substance he could put in his body dulled it all. 
Then it began to destroy his career and finally left him a dried out husk in a treatment center. He'd kicked it all and pulled himself back together, but it had taken months of shrinks and months of sheer will. And the only part of him that wanted to give it all up was the knowledge that he could keep another company from dying out in space for no good goddamn reason. Talby, on the other hand, took a different path. The second lieutenant, an ace SV-52 pilot, and a hell of a shot with a flechette rifle, hadn't come back damaged. Not at first. Instead of exploding in a bright flash of rage or simply coming apart, he'd suffered in silence and isolation. Until, of course, he finally cracked. He'd stopped eating. He'd stopped talking. He'd stopped leaving his quarters. He'd stopped doing anything at all. The Scaparelli AI had alerted Talby's commanding officer that the man was no longer cogent, no longer responsive. An intervention ensued that left Talby in the mental ward for a week. He recovered quickly, but then knew his friends still lived his days in fear of the nightmares that came looking for him when the lights went out. The ghosts of those he'd killed and those he couldn't save. And here we are again, Dunn thought. Like, Nero, Kelly Morris' squad. All casualties he couldn't control. At least there was still a shot, albeit a small one, to rescue Kelly Mora and her squad. Dunn knew Talby would make that his highest priority now. Dunn couldn't blame him. He stood from the command chair and stretched. You have the bridge, he said to Oakes. Need a coffee? That would be great. Thank you, sir. Dunn nodded to his pilot and made his way to the mess. He'd shut down his feeds, opting to live in reality for a few minutes. Since all the Marines were aboard, apart from Kelly Mora and her squad, of course, he could relax a little. If a new threat emerged, Oaks and Black would let him know, although that was cold comfort. The KBO was coming, and when it arrived, they'd finally find out what it was. As expected, Talby stood next to the drink dispenser. The support craft pilot stood with his face pointed directly at the polished aluminum housing. His shoulders slumped with fatigue or depression, likely both. James, Dunn said quietly. Talby stiffened slightly before turning to face his CO. He raised a hand to salute, but Dunn shook his head and waved him off. More damage to the SV-52? Aye, sir, Talby said. He lifted the mag can of water to his lips and drank deeply. Beads of sweat stood out on his forehead, although he'd taken off his helmet several minutes ago. Pop the hell out of the hull. Another patch? Dunn said. More statement than a question. Aye, sir. Talby said, and finished the mag can. He tossed it in the recycler, relishing the tinny clang as metal struck metal. The can disappeared into the machine's yawning mouth. A brief buzz, and the machine went silent. We'll have to refill the air tanks, too. Dunn said nothing. Talby dropped his gaze to his boots as though waiting for something. Dunn took pity on him and broke the silence. We have two dead Marines, he said. Talby's eyes immediately flicked upward to regard the captain. And neither of those casualties are your fault, James. Talby's lip quivered for an instant, and then his stony expression returned. Aye, sir, he said quietly. You believe me? Aye, sir, Talby said again, his voice devoid of anything save submission. What are my new orders, since we're not going to try and tow this fucking hulk out of here? Dunn winced. Without saying it, Talby was essentially asking why the fuck he'd sacrificed one of his marines for a scrubbed mission. Also, why had they risked themselves for nothing? Your orders, Dunn said, will be coming shortly. We now know the ship won't hold together. If I'd known that earlier, I wouldn't have sent marines out there. Talby nodded. Aye, sir. The plan now, Dunn said, is to get the beacon off Mira and send it to Pluto. The lieutenant raised an eyebrow. Pluto? Yes, Dunn said. Noble and the two privates, they building something to send it on? Yes. Dunn walked to the drink machine and made two coffees. A skiff of sorts, something small with a lot of speed. Great, Talby said. So how are we getting the beacon out of Mira? Dunn fought the urge to shrug. We're going to need a little recon. I'll need you to fly to Mira's aft. Fire a couple of nanoprobes in and see what we can see. Aye, sir, Talby said. May I ask a favor, sir? What's that? Talby's placid face burned. Let me blow the bitch up when we're done. Dunn smiled. I think you and Gunny should have the honors, certainly. Talby sneered. Thank you, sir. <laughs>